theistic evolution critique, the origin of moral conscience. We've been going through the book, Theistic Evolution, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. Uh, it's divided into three parts, but before we go there, I want to introduce what the book is aiming at specifically. There are several different ways of putting together um, in a theist and Christian uh, or even Jewish tradition uh, how, the, uh, how the variety of life on earth was made or came to be. One of them, of course, is young life creationism of various kinds. Um, uh, one of them is commonly known as old earth creationism, but probably should be revised to call it young, uh, pardon me, old life creation. Uh, one of them is a theistic evolution, but one that is friendly to intelligent design. That is to say, if you look at it, you can tell that God was involved. One of them is what you might call non-intelligent design, theistic evolution. It happened through a slow process, and if you look at it, you can't tell that God was involved. And finally, there's flat-out atheistic evolution. Now, the book is obviously not approving of atheistic evolution, but that's not what it's written for. It's written for people who are trying to choose between non-ID theistic evolution and the others, and is specifically saying that non-ID theistic evolution really isn't a good scientific, philosophical, or uh, religious option. This particular uh, chapter is by a uh, Finnish fellow by the name of Tapia Pulamet, Pulam, Puolimatke, boy. I, obviously, I don't speak Finnish. Uh, and <clears throat> it is in section two, which is the philosophical critique of theistic evolution. We've been through the scientific one. Uh, one more chapter, and we'll be into the theological one. Um, but um, this one is called The Origin of Moral Conscience, Theistic evolution versus intelligent design. And again, there is a theistic evolution that is intelligent design friendly, and that is not supposed to be being critiqued here, although there are some hints that maybe it might not be the best. Um, in summary, theistic evolutionists generally agree that Darwinian evolution is not able to establish the origin of actual moral obligations. All that the evolutionary story can possibly do is explain how we acquired moral beliefs and emotions. And of course, atheistic evolutionists say, well, there are no such things, and you're just figuring out how you got your illusions. The problem for theistic evolutionists is, however, that current evolutionary accounts fail even in the latter task. They can't account how we got our sense of morality. They fail to explain the origin of moral conscience. The human capacity to discern moral truths cannot be reduced to a product of the kind of combinatorial present, uh, processes excuse me, that are available to a Darwinian account of evolution. Although theistic evolutionists assume that the idea of moral conscience as an expression of God's design for humans is fully compatible with various naturalistic explanations of the origin of moral conscience, they fail to specify a natural process that could plausibly do the job. In this respect, theistic evolutionism amounts to little more than a statement that they do not see a logical problem in assuming that God could have used a natural process. And I guess if you say that there isn't a logical problem, then God could have done it that way, and then we'd better accept that it was done that way, which makes not very much sense. The chapter begins, although theistic evolutionists usually adhere to theories prevalent in evolutionary science and claim that God used evolutionary mechanisms to attain his purposes, the origin of morality presents a special problem. Morality is generally experienced as involving a transcendent source of obligation which seems to assume a divine lawgiver. As C. Stephen Evans argues in detail, moral obligations are objective, motivating, binary in nature, 
universal, overriding, and allow us to bring deliberation to closure. To see moral obligations as originating in the originating in the commands of a good, wise God provides an adequate explanation for all these features. It provides an ontological foundation for moral obligations, and it fits well with the idea that God has endowed humans with conscience and ability to grasp moral truths. Thus, it allows for the view that even atheists are generally conscious of the obligating force of moral rules and, in that sense, have knowledge of God. They are aware of God's claim on their lives, even if they are not aware of that claim as God's claim on their lives. In that sense, as Kierkegaard points out, there has never been an atheist, even though there certainly have been many who have been unwilling to let what they know, that the God exists, get control over their minds. This experience is confirmed from the atheistic side by Jesse Baring, as a way of thinking, God is an inherent part of our natural cognitive systems and ridding ourselves of him, really thoroughly, permanently removing him from our heads, would require a neurosurgeon, not a science teacher, and maybe not even a neurosurgeon. Theistic evolutionists generally agree that evolutionary theory cannot explain or account for actual moral obligations. The moral source available within the context of Darwinian evolution are not able to establish the origin of overriding moral obligations and provide the foundation for universal benevolence and human rights. So theistic evolutionists would reject what Angus Manuge, um, is that Manuge? I'm not sure how he pronounces his name, calls strong evolutionary ethics, which, are, which argues that what counts as a moral value itself depends on biological history. As theists, they would reject this ontological thesis and instead adhere to a weaker thesis, or what could be called uh, weak EE, about moral psychology, which states that moral sensibilities have developed through an evolutionary process. In this view, all that the evolutionary story can possibly do is explain how we acquired moral beliefs and emotions. So theistic evolutionists reject the idea that uh, moral obligations themselves are evolutionarily determined. That's something given from God. But maybe how we know it could, become, could come from evolution. Theistic evolutionists thus believe that current evolutionary accounts can explain uh, the emergence of the human capacity to uh, discern moral values. My aim in this chapter is to argue, on the contrary, that current evolutionary accounts fail to explain the origin of moral conscience. The human capacity to discern the morally right and good cannot be reduced to a product of the kind of combinatorial processes that are available to a Darwinian account of evolution. Although theistic evolutionists assume that the idea of moral conscience as an expression of God's design plans for humans is fully compatible with various naturalistic causal stories, various, about how humans might have acquired such a faculty, they failed to specify a natural process that could plausibly do the job. In this respect, theistic evolutionism amounts to little more than the statement of an very abstract and metaphorical plane that they do not see a logical problem in assuming that God could have used a natural process. Naturalistic attempts at explaining the origin of moral sensibilities. Now this next part is not talking about theistic evolutionists directly, but remember, theistic evolutionists are borrowing all this stuff, so it's an important background material. Various naturalistic evolutionary theories acknowledge that human beings are gen generally experience moral obligations as commands by a godlike being. Thus, attempts have been made to account for these features within a naturalistic context. For example, the supernatural punishment theory of Dominic Johnson and Oliver Kruger suggests that belief in supernatural punishment has brought evolutionary advantage as it serves to pr promote cooperation. Individuals are dissuaded from free riding because they fear supernatural retribution as a consequence of their actions. Combined with the assumption that human cognition is an evolutionary novel canvas for the working of natural selection, it leads to a naturalistic theory that the expectation and fear of supernatural punishment serves to promote cooperation. 
If supernatural punishment is held as a belief, then this threat becomes a deterrent in reality, so the mechanism can work regardless of whether the threat is genuine or not. And of course, under their breath, these people are saying it's not really genuine. These naturalists assume that some of the cognitive faculties conduct, conducive to survival produce a tendency to believe in a god in, to whom people feel morally accountable. However, the process of natural selection does not select belief on the basis of their truth, but on the basis of their value for survival, which means that even if you believe in God, that doesn't mean that he really exists. Thus, the natural tendency to believe in a God does not provide a reason to believe that God actually exists or that moral morality is objective, since there's a wholly natural explanation for this religious tendency. The belief in God and objective morality can therefore be regarded as an illusion which is what these people want. Even though primitive hominids, according to this theory, developed the automatic tendency to fear a super creator that holds them morally responsible, such instinctive moral convictions are illusions without any truth value. And of course, can be disregarded, excuse me. Um, many naturalists claim that scientific knowledge about the evolutionary origin of the God instinct implies knowledge of its illusionary nature. Once you really understand, you will be an atheist. This naturalistic approach appeals to the so-called dual process theory, according to which human beings reason on two levels, one, on an automatic, fast, and intuitive system, one level, almost reflexive, and on a reflective, slow, and analytic system, two level. The automatic tendency to believe in a godlike being to whom human beings feel morally responsible remains even if a person reflectively rejects it on the basis of advanced scientific knowledge because it has been programmed into the human cognitive functioning by the process of evolution. The dual process approach has been subjected to some criticism, however. Not all conscious deliberate system to activity is properly called analytic. And this is a paper that was uh, presented and um, um, interesting paper to fo follow, and we'll have one more note on it. Naturalists thus assume that more people rely on their automatic reason and follow their immediate arise, immediately arising spontaneous intuitions, the more they tend to believe in God or uh, exhibit intrinsic religiosity. On the other hand, the more people are ready to evaluate arguments objectively and critically consider alternatives, the more they show religious disbelief. As the force of the God instinct fades, its embedded moral sense of being responsible to the super creator will vanish as well, or so they hope. Skipping over a paragraph, uh, obviously we're not reading the whole thing or we'd be here too long. Uh, um, however, an empirical study by U Julie Yonker and others obtained the opposite results. Analytic thought does not necessarily influence religious, intrinsic religious religiosity, but if there is such an influence, it goes towards more religiosity. If you really think, you become more religious, which is interesting perspective. These naturalistic theories can be challenged by pointing out that many people with critical minds and extensive knowledge end up with a rational conviction that morality actually originates in God's commands, and that without this theistic foundation, morality would lose much of its significance. The, uh, two, the approach of theistic evolution. We've surveyed how atheists look at it. Now, theistic evolution wants to keep that morality. While intelligent design supporters focus, on their, focus their main attack on the scientific claim that moral and religious sentiments evolved through the combinatorial process involved in Darwinian evolution, Theistic evolutionists regard that as a wrong strategy, at least most of them, as we will see. Um, a major strategy of the theistic evolutionism is to attack the uncritical ways in which natural, uh, theory, naturalistic theories often mix philosophical assumptions with scientific results. The, uh, quoting, the scientific fields of sociobiology and evolutionary psychology are young because these fields present presently have theories running well in advance of empirical data. This, that is the attack on scientific claim that human moral and religious sentiments evolved, might seem an attractive strategy, but don't go there. Nevertheless, I believe it is the wrong strategy. The problem does not lie in the scientific claim. The problem lies in the philosophical claim 
that if our moral and religious sentiments evolve, then moral and religious beliefs cannot have objective status or truth content. Uh, in other words, even if they were right, they were still wrong. And uh, maybe both are true. Lauren Harzma suggests that we need not dispute the current scientific hypothesis about how morality evolved. We need only dispute the naturalistic philosophical extrapolation as to why morality exists. One such naturalistic fallacy is the fallacy of nothing buttery. And by the way, that's uh, stolen straight from uh, C.S. Lewis. Um, this is the claim that a complete evolutionary description of the existence of morality does invalidate the truth, utility, or significance of uh, other levels of description of morality. In other words, if you can prove it, it came about scientifically, then it has no value. So a major difference between intelligent design theory and theistic evolutionism is a difference in strategy. Theistic evolutionists like Har Harzma admit that the current naturalistic theories are vulnerable to attack as scientific theories, but they assume that given time, a well-founded naturalistic theory will emerge to explain the way moral and religious sentiments have evolved. We will wind up fighting uh, wrong battles and be coming out flanked in the war. Therefore, they think it wiser to focus on the philosophical weakness of naturalistic theories and their inadequate separation of philosophical assumptions and scientific results. The intelligent design strategy is, of course, more risky in the sense that once you attack a specific th scientific theory, you risk being proved wrong. But many intelligent design supporters see such grave problems in current evolutionary theories that they feel justified in criticizing them instead of merely trying to reconcile the Christian faith with the evolutionary story. To some extent, theistic evolutionists, and some more than others, do this as well. Various interpretations of theistic evolution. First, there are there at least two major approaches that a theistic evolution may take with regard to the origin of moral conscience. And one, she may argue that the evolutionary account is valid insofar as it deals with topics that belong to the field of natural science. The standard evolutionary account can explain the development of human beings as biological beings. But we may need to rely on other sources of information to gain insight about the origin of spiritual and moral aspects of the human nature. For example, God may create human beings by con conferring an immaterial soul on what was formerly a wholly material primate. In such a view, God creates human life within the process of common biological ancestry, although humans are considered constituted by more than biology. That is, something happened with morality, not just that there is, but also that we have it. A theistic evolutionist may think, this is a second option, that the scientific account of the origin of moral conscience explains the development of the effective and cognitive capacities to make moral judgments and recognize the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. This happened by an evolutionary mechanism. Once evolutionary mechanisms had developed the human capacity to discern the difference between good and evil, right and wrong, although why that was advantageous for survival is not clear, um, human beings may then use these capacities to recognize the moral law, which has a transcendent origin. The moral law is transcendent. Our understanding of it is uh, conditioned. In order for human beings to acquire adequate knowledge of moral principles, at some point in human history, the evolutionary development of morality must be augmented with divine personal revelation. Must be? Uh, maybe at the beginning it had to be, but that's a different discussion. A theistic evolutionist of this sort may argue that God has preordained or guided natural processes to create human beings in his image and has provided them with a genuine sense of morality. God may design initial conditions conducive to the development of human beings with a moral conscience, or he may exert influences on the genetic material of a primate, primate gamete by directly causing a mutation or by influencing the outcome of probabilistic events like recombination or chromosomal assortment in ways that would present no evidence of intervention. See, it's very important not to have God's activity detected. 
This view would not be an obvious conflict with naturalistic account, since God's intervention could not be discerned by science. Just random chance, and there it was. You see, what's happening is we're afraid to present anything that would be actual evidence of God. The crucial problem with evolutionary theory in regard to moral development can be highlighted with the following questions. One, if human moral sensibilities have gradually developed from animal forms of cooperation based on individual or group advantage, how can we account for the qualitative jump from mere instinctual drives and prudential considerations to general, uh, genuine moral considerations that trump self-interest and make human beings aware of their obligations to follow the commands of an absolutely love, a good and loving God. And number two, can we claim a qualitative difference between human beings and animals and establish a foundation for the human capacity to discern human dignity and fundamental human rights if we suppose that human beings have gradually developed from their animal ancestors through Darwinian mechanisms? Those are the two questions he's posing. Okay. B, human morality is a result of God's special intervention. So this is one case. God did something, and you can tell. The first approach common among theistic evolutionists is represented by Francis Collins. And I would agree from, from my reading of Francis Collins that, that, that he's being accurate here. Who re rejects the evolutionary account of the origin of moral conscience. In fact, it's more than that. This is what convinced Collins that there was a God, was morality. Collins thinks that the validity of the evolutionary account is limited to the biological nature of human beings. He regards morality as part of man's spiritual nature that has been directly created by God. Collins argues six premises. We're going to only read the last three. Once evolution got underway, no special supernatural invention was required. Humans are part of this process, sharing a common ancestor with the great apes, however six, but humans are also unique in ways that defy evolutionary explanation and point to our spiritual nature. This includes the existence of the moral law, the knowledge of right and wrong, and the search for God that characterizes all human cultures throughout history. So those are the uh, three of the six uh, premises Colin, uh, Collins argues for. Collins does not feel any tension between his premises four and six. Collins probably thinks that as far as the biological evolution of human beings is concerned, no special supernatural intervention was required once God had created the initial conditions and the mechanisms of, of evolution. You just wait, it unfolds. But he seems to assume such an intervention with regard to the origin of the spiritual nature of human beings. I think that Collins is right in his assumption that human moral conscience cannot be explained by referring to animal affections and their forms of co cooperation. Animal forms of cooperation consist of instinctual drives and automatic cognitive tendencies to feel and react in certain ways, and these fall within the scope of a causal account. A failure to act according to instinctive solidarity felt towards one members of one's own herd is not a moral failure, but only a malfunction of the biological psychological instinct. The malfunction of an instinct hardly makes one morally guilty. And he's right about that. Or you can look at it th this way, moral conscience as an evolutionary product. Co Collins' approach can be seen as a deviation from the more general theistic ev evolutionary approach. It would be interesting to discuss why. Um, to accept evolutionary explanations wholesale and to argue that God has used evolutionary processes for his purposes. Thus, a more prevalent approach within the theistic evolutionist camp is to assume that evolutionary theories about the origin of morality explain the origin of human moral conscience, even though these evolutionary accounts might need supplementing and enriching by theological accounts. But not too much, because if there's too much supplementation, you can tell it needs it, which, in which case you're violating the theistic evolutionary premise. Evolution can really account for everything. For example, Carl Giberson, selfishness, in fact, drives the evolutionary process. Unselfish creatures died, 
and their unselfish genes perished with them. Selfish creatures who attended to their own needs for food, power, and sex flourished and passed on these genes to their offspring. After many generations, selfishness was so fully programmed in our genomes that it was a significant part of what we now call human nature. And presumably, it didn't get fixed in any human atom, as we've seen before. Giberson denied that the fall into sin was a specific historical event. He interprets the fallenness of human nature as inherent selfishness produced by the evolutionary struggle for survival. So he doesn't like selfishness, it's just that um, it's obvious from an evolutionary point of view that it should have been the default position. While pointing out the role of selfish desires in the process of evolutionary development, Giberson argues that human beings also have an innate tendency to altruism, a readiness to make sacrifices for others, which Giberson admits is scientifically harder to understand than selfishness. Try virtually impossible to understand? But Giberson still thinks that the origin of these altruistic affections can be explained by evolutionary science. He recounts the story by Franz de Waal about a bonobo who saw a starling hit a glass wall and fall to the ground. The bonobo picked up the bird and tried to help it to fly again. When its attempts failed, it watched the bird until it flew away on its own. The good Samaritan bonobo, I guess. Um, Giberson does not consider the possibility that this kind of animal behavior could be controlled by instincts. Now this is uh, Polomatka's um, critique of Giberson. Um, see if it's persuasive to you. In which case it would have nothing to do with morality. He points out that there are countless other examples of si similar animal behaviors and they seem to resemble the story of the Good Samaritan. Giberson thereby rejects the idea of a great qualitative distinction between humans and the higher primates. He assumes that his rejection is based on incontrovertible evidence and seems to be oblivious to the fact that his rejection may be a priori and may refl be reflected in his conceptualization of the evidence. In other words, that's what he's been conditioned to see. Giberson's extreme interpretation of the historical fall into sin in completely biological terms is rejected even by many theistic evolutionists. Lauren Harsma criticized the idea that an action should be labeled selfish merely because it provides long-term benefits to one's reproductive chances. It is misleading to follow popular literature on sociobiology and evolutionary psychology, which employs a linguistic maneuver in which every action that improves one's reproductive chances is labeled selfish because to be prudential doesn't mean to be being inherently selfish. It may be smart in the long run. DeWall acknowledges the one inherent problem in the evolutionary account for the origin of moral sensibilities. Human morality has evolved as a way of banding together against adversaries. The profound irony is that our noblest achievement, morality, has evolutionary ties to our basest behavior, warfare. He writes, the sense of community required by the former was provided by the latter. If we didn't have war, we wouldn't have morality. Duwall recognizes that the basic idea of morality is contrary to the logic of evolutionary struggle for survival. However, he does not seem to recognize that this discrepancy is a serious problem for the evolutionary account. The evolutionary struggle for survival where each creature tries to destroy its competitors involves a perspective contrary to that of the universal ethic of love. Duwall admits that the endeavor to derive human moral sensibilities from their supposed animal precursors leads to an understanding of morality as an instinctive tendency rather than as something controlled by rational deliberation and conscious choice. Human behavior derives above all from fast automated emotional judgments, remember we've heard this before, and only secondarily from slower conscious processes, Duwall writes. This is due to the fact that morality evolved at a time when hominids lived in small foraging societies and had to make instant life or death decisions without time for conscious moral deliberation. Reasoning comes afterwards as a justification, in this scenario anyway. Theology and biology in cooperation. Jeffrey Schloss, another representative of the second approach within theistic evolutionism, defends the following main theses, and here they are. Thesis one, which is this whole uh, part of the paragraph. 
The naturalistic account of evolution can be reconciled with theism mainly because God may have set the initial conditions so that the evolutionary process eventually produced human beings created in the image of God. That's number one. That would be pure theistic evolution. Two, B, God may have influenced the causal processes of evolution in ways that cannot be detected by natural science. That's point two. Notice that this is nice theoretical um, theory. In theory, God did it, but in, in practice you can't tell, so that it's still in the can't tell God uh, exists from nature uh, camp. And then C, God has influenced the context of contents of human morality through direct encounters with human beings. But presumably those would be detectable. So now you're starting to fray the edges of the uh, theistic evolution. Two, this is his second point, although the naturalistic account of evolution is right in giving a correct outline of the evolutionary process, the naturalistic description can be enriched by theological considerations. If you use theology, it will help you to understand more deeply, I guess. Um, three, although the evolutionary process is often described as completely contingent, that is completely the result of chance, it actually shows a planned progress towards the higher forms of life. Now we're getting really dangerously close to that line, aren't we? You can tell that there's a God because things are progressing instead of just going randomly. Theology must be ready to listen to science in these people's opinion on the issues of ethics. It may actually gain fresh spiritual understanding by learning from contemporary evolutionary accounts. For example, scientific accounts of kin selection and reciprocal altruism, which of course Jesus had nothing but contempt for. If you do good to those who do good to you, how are you better than the Gentiles, right? Um, reciprocal altruism may advance our understanding of the central tendency of moral affections, which may be theologically regarded as expressions of common grace. In this view, God has a twofold role in the development of human morality. He has guided those evolutionary processes that led to the development of human moral capacities, not too tightly because otherwise we could tell he was doing it. And <clears throat> he is personally engaged with human beings, thereby influencing their moral perceptions, affections, and prescriptions. In this way, Schloss wants to account for the human capacity to sense moral obligations as God's commands. God has directly intervened in human history and has made personal encounters with human beings. Presumably the Bible would be a record of some of those accounts. But can Schloss account for the fact that this sense of moral obligation is built into human nature? In this respect, he doesn't want to appeal to God's direct intervention. He regards the development of moral capacities as the result of natural evolutionary processes, even though they go the opposite way. Thus, he has to appeal to a naturalistic theory that explains the qualitative change from animal instincts to genuine morality through Darwinian mechanisms. Schloss compares the evolutionary development of moral capacities to the development of human babies into morally conscious human beings. His comparison of the moral maturation of a toddler, and here uh, the author is going to critique it, is with the evolutionary development of pre-human hominids into morally responsible human beings is misleading, however, as these two processes are qualitatively different. Schloss is right in claiming that toddlers are not yet morally responsible for their behavior, but that is due to their deficient conception about the consequences of their actions. The research conducted by Paul Bloom and others indicates that not only toddlers, but even babies have a moral sense, the capacity to make certain kinds of judgment, to distinguish between good and bad, kindness and cruelty. The assumption that human morality can develop out of non-moral uh, origins assumes a quali qualitative jump. I will later argue that such a qualitative jump cannot be explained by Darwinian mechanisms. The contingency problem, the, in order to maintain the idea of God's ultimate control of the evolutionary process, theistic evolutionists have to challenge the extreme contingency view defended by naturalists like Stephen Jay Gould. 
Oh, you, but you, that's this debating evolutionists about science. Again, we're getting really close to the edge of theistic evolution. The evolutionary approach, at least Stephen Jay Gould's evolutionary approach, assumes that an instinctual morality has developed because of its survival uh, value in the process of, of evolution or as a byproduct of evolved capacities. There's nothing necessary in such moral convictions, however. This kind of a naturalistic evolutionary process cannot account for moral knowledge because the Darwinian evolutionary story regards human beings as one contingent occurrence among many possibilities. The natural history that led to human beings consists of contingent events which could have led to another kind of being. Stephen Jay Gould argues that the history of life is a reduction of initial possibilities to just a few surviving groups. And uh, there's a long paragraph on how that exactly works, but uh, we'll, we'll omit that. Um, Charles Darwin argues that this has radical implications for our understanding of morality. Moral sensibilities could have acquired completely different characteristics had the contingent evolutionary processes taken alternative routes. And, for example, if, for instance, to take an extreme case, men were reared under precisely the same conditions as hive bees, there can hardly be a doubt that our unmarried females would, like the worker bees, think it a sacred duty to kill their brother. And mothers would strive to kill their fertile daughters, and no one would think of interfering. In the same vein, Michael Ruse, and I'll admit his comments, and Jeffrey Schloss and Michael Murray, however, challenge this interpretation. They argue that evolutionary history displays a more com complicated interplay of contingency and necessity than the radical contingency view entails. And even if the outcome of evolution were contingent on chance events, it does not exclude divine providence. Even if an event that is necessary for a particular outcome appears to be highly improbable, and again, we're starting to stray towards intelligent design territory here, this does not mean that an omniscient God could not know it would happen or an omnipotent God could not guarantee it would happen. So God could intervene and we might even be able to detect his intervention. As Manuge points out, if weak evolutionary ethics is affirmed in its ambitious form, so there's two brands of weak evolutionary ethics, then although beings raised like a hive bee would not make fratricide a duty, our moral sense would tell them that it was. Well, that doesn't sound too good. If so, our moral beliefs do not provide reliable access to moral reality. Uh, of course, some peoples and some cultures, uh, moral sense doesn't provide an, a good uh, uh, access to actual morality. Theistic evolutionists might then appeal to modest weak, so we're going weak, weak, evolutionary ethics, which admits the unreliability of humans' moral sense, but claims that evolution has provided other faculties such as reason or intuition that allow access to moral truth. One problem with this approach is that we do not have an adequate evolutionary explanation for the emergence of reason and rational intuition. So all you've done is moved your problem to another area. Skipping over a little bit, so the basic dilemma of evolutionary ethics is that if the belief system is true, moral truths are unknowable. Theistic evolutionists try to escape these epistemological problems by appealing to God's guidance. But then, now you're back to, well, you really can tell. So, perhaps um, uh, Collins was right to begin with. The problem, however, is that Slosh and Murray can hold on to this idea only on the metaphorical level because the Darwinian combinatorial processes do not allow a qualitative change from instinctive morality to the cognitive capacity to d discern moral truths. So they either have to presuppose, presuppose God's miraculous intervention or assume that we still function at the instinctual level in our moral behavior. We are not actually free to make moral choices or to recognize moral truths. So the final thing is, you're going to have to go with Collins whether you like it or not. Uh, three, the moral gap. Theistic evolutionists usually assume that the human capacity to discern moral obligations developed from 
instinctual forms of cooperation among animals. The difficulty then is to find a mechanism to explain how these instinctual drives have developed into genuine moral cognitive co cap cognitions capable of discerning the requirements of universal benevolence, transcendent justice, overriding moral obligation and absolute human dignity. Skipping a couple of paragraphs, Moreland, this is J.P. Moreland, who we've met before, argues in detail that there is no naturalistic combinatorial explanation of the appearance of simple properties of consciousness. And skipping over a few paragraphs, not only are naturalistic explanations unable to account for the emergence of moral conscience, but as J.P. Moreland has shown, naturalism isn't able to account for human consciousness, free will, universal rationality, or substantial soul either. Without these human capacities, morality would lose its significance. Conclusion. Theistic evolutionists have the commendable goal of helping theistic students keep their faith under secular educational systems that indoctrinate them with the naturalistic worldview. The problem with their accommodating approach is that they eventually end up modifying the contents of the theistic faith and the nature of morality to fit the evolutionary account. They hide the problem in the evolutionary account by vague metaphors and create the impression that Darwinian mechanisms are able to produce qualitative new forms of consciousness. The vague idea that God has used evolutionary processes to attain his goals may ease the tension be that believers feel between their faith and the current consensus in evolutionary science. Uh, eventually, however, <coughs> the problems inherent in such vague metaphors could undermine our trust in the human capacity for moral knowledge. While theistic students may be helped in the short term because they are relieved of the pressure either to reject their theistic faith or be labeled bigoted representatives of an anti-science and anti-knowledge superstition, the foundations of their faith may be undermined in the long term because of the widespread accommodation of the Christian faith and the nature of morality into presuppositions of the naturalistic world of view. The weak point in the reasoning of theistic evolutionists is their inadequate analysis of the qualitative difference between non-moral forms of cooperation and genuine moral considerations. What is lacking is an adequate philosophical analysis of the unique nature of moral conscience and its difference from mere prudential or other non-moral considerations. Now, my take on all this, I think that Poole and Matka makes an interesting case for rejecting that branch of theistic evolution that does not allow for detectable divine intervention at the point of the acquisition of morality by the human race. Now, I'm frankly reluctant to settle questions by purely philosophical means, partly because of the failure of Greek philosophy, which is probably the most, one of the most powerful forms. Um, I do agree with him that evolution that is defined as natural selection acting on random mutations cannot account for either moral conscience or moral behavior. The position of Francis Collins that divine intervention was required and that we can tell is, in my opinion, much more defensible. It is, incidentally, the same position that C.S. Lewis takes and the position that ID-friendly theistic evolutionists in general take. Uh, it is in broad agreement with creationist posi uh, positions on this point. Both old age and young age believe that God actually imbued humans with a sense of right and wrong that was given to them miraculously. It is not in agreement with the principle of theistic evolution. Not all theistic evolutionists are equal. Collins has historically moved towards Christianity from atheism. Many of the other ones have moved away from Christianity in a certain sense. They would hate me saying that um, because they think they're still Christians. Uh, in fact, Collins is a partial ID adherent. He accepts, and I heard him on the radio just saying flat out, that there's evidence for divine intervention at the start of the universe. The universe is, looks designed. That's because it had a designer. Um, and he obviously accepts divine intervention at the appearance of moral conscience. 
I think we should welcome this. This is movement away from the dominant paradigm of our times. The principle of theistic evolution is that one must never take scientific claims, one must never make scientific claims, as someday we may discover that they were wrong. So for theistic evolutionists, you never contradict the science of your day. I think the consistent application of this principle would necessitate belief in all detectable divine activity, and that includes the resurrection. And that kind of puts you outside of Christianity, which is why I say some of those people I'm concerned, they may not actually be Christian. The principle, at least in my opinion, the principle itself needs to be trashed. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. <laughs> Go ahead. I, uh, I, f I find this uh, discussion very interesting that uh, A little bit esoteric in terms of my biological background uh, in that the word kin selection was mentioned there once, I think, in what you read. Uh, this has been such an extended uh, contentious debate that I, I wonder why it was uh, not included in the uh, chapter, although you can't cover everything. Uh, but uh, this evolutionary psychology is, keeps moving in that direction, uh, even though we might point out the architect of, uh, well, he's, he's not the architect, probably the lead promoter of kin selection was Wilson at Harvard who for 30 years in his books and sociobiology and so on promoted the fact that uh, the reason that uh, you had altruism is that you uh, provide selection by uh, at least providing for your kin to survive. You know, and the story begins with uh, bees. Uh, why do bees uh, actually commit suicide to protect their, the beehive? Well, uh, that, that was fairly easy, uh, fairly easily answered from an evolutionary standpoint in that the beehive is an organism as a whole, and so it provides for the survival of it is. But, but that was uh, countered quite readily by more advanced organisms. Why is a uh, mother bird, for instance, will, will act as though she's lame and so on in the presence of a predator to keep that predator from uh, attacking her offspring. Uh, and uh, that's a little harder to answer. And uh, it's well recognized, and there's so many examples of that, it's well recognized that altruism does occur in animals. And uh, Wilson came forth with kin selection that, well, uh, you can sacrifice yourself. You're still preserving your genes, at least the genes of your kin, because they have the same genes you have. Therefore, evolution proceeds, in spite of the fact that you have altruism on the part of, of uh, an individual. Still, you're protecting, and, and this has been the, the prevailing dogma in... Uh, uh, sociobiology uh, for for uh, altruism uh, for years and years, and it, it's still there. 
Uh, people don't want to uh, give it up, even though E.O. Wilson, who had promoted this for some 30 years, comes out at the end and he says, kin selection doesn't work. Uh, E.O. Wilson, the leading sociobiologist at Harvard University. Uh, uh, others there like Gould and uh, Lewington, in the very same building there at Harvard, uh, we're not promoting, I mean, sociobiology. It's, it's a contentious issue. They, they, they thought, it doesn't work, type of thing. London says, oh, come on. Society changes uh, so fast. Genes don't change that fast. This is not gene. Genes have nothing to do with this. It's just uh, behavior, type of thing, for, for one of the arguments that is presented. So, uh, <clears throat> where are we on this issue? <clears throat> Here we have the leader who's denied, who promoted denying it, uh, but we have the sociological community and the scientific community and uh, evolutionary psychology still stained by the idea of kin selection, which uh, never did have, uh, it had uh, marginal scientific defense, although uh, Wilson, a friend uh, of his, his uh, wrote a book uh, trying to defend this. The book was quickly destroyed. Uh, uh, the mathematics wasn't good, and so on. So, uh, this issue sits there. To me, it's... Uh, you might talk about survival... As, uh, and this is very important in, in our concepts of morality. We have concepts of morality uh, that don't have all that much to do with survival. I think it's hard probably to find a human being who thinks it's okay to steal. We all know, hey, this belongs to somebody else. I shouldn't take it type of thing. Uh, why is that there? So on. There's something beyond what atoms and matter and energy can put together and so on, and the, or the mechanistic thing. There's no question something beyond. Of course, this chapter uh, defends it very well. Uh, our consciousness and all these things, um, our honesty, uh, or I think... Uh, most uh, human beings, you know, if somebody is hurting in a car accident, the car's on fire, you're going to try and help that person. I mean, this is, it's there. Even though uh, evolutionary wise, uh, forgetting about kin selection, you would not want to do that because, hey, uh, the longer you live, the more your genes are going to survive. Uh, kin selection, I shouldn't say kin selection. But, Survival of your genes, which is uh, supposed to be the goal of evolution, uh, survives. So we got that aspect. I think uh, I thought the chapter was good, but it uh, there's a whole area out there and a battle going on there that uh, mm -hmm. could have been included. Yeah. Well, my my response to that is that. Um, he hasn't cited any of the evidence out there. Um, this being in the philosophical uh, section, I'm not terribly surprised um, because he's not going to be arguing about what, this, what the studies show. Um, he's arguing more of a philosophical what is required. But the fact of the matter is if evolution is aimed towards the survival of the fittest, fit does not necessarily have anything to do with your morality um, if you define fit as passing on more genes. In fact, it's arguable that in certain areas, fit does not have to do with uh, or is, is opposed in some ways. One could say that natural selection is leading human beings to a point where we are 
completely neglecting morality. And maybe that's part of the experiment that's being done, is to show that, uh, that belief in natural selection, belief that in, belief in selfishness, basically, is inimical to true morality, that the two don't mix. But evolution should push you in that direction. It should. In fact, it's arguable. Sometimes it does. It seems to me that um, that's really right there the original lie that uh, the devil basically, in saying, I don't need, I'm as good as Jesus. I don't need to have that morality from God. I can do that myself. It seems like we're being sold right here, that original problem. Probably one of my weakest areas in the area of science is this topic here, how does it relate to ethics? Um, fascinating area, but you have to really be well-versed both in science and ethics and evolutionary biology and all that. But um, just from my own limited viewpoint, I see a similar problem between morality and sexuality. Uh, the problem with the evolutionists is to explain sexuality. How do you get male and female? If you start with one single... Um, atom, or, or more than that, one single bit of protoplasm, how is that going to divide up and you're going to get some male and some female? So there's a duality there. Same way with morality. How do you uh, get to the point where you can make a choice or differentiate between that which is good and that which is not good? So all of morality is based on a binary system. If it's not binary, if it's, if it's unitary, then there's no morality as we know it. There may be a type of morality, and maybe you can argue on that. Sexuality also is binary. Uh, at some point, you have male and female unless you have asexual regeneration for eons of time, and I don't think we find a lot of evidence for that. Now, what I'm leading to is that whether it's sexuality or morality, you've got to have the element of choice there. Choice involves two options. If there is no choice, then it's all programmed and then you don't have morality. A choice then involves rationality. And I'm glad um, the, the author mentioned in this chapter that rationality is a big problem. And how do you explain morality without rationality? One has to come before the other. But how can you have rationality without morality? Because rationality, if it's not able to choose that which is good and survival of the fittest even, to end up with the best results, then rationality is going to die out and it's going to be excluded from uh, evolutionary processes. It's going to be weeded out through natural selection. So to me, this is kind of a new evidence. I'm just brainstorming here. I may be wrong. A new evidence that uh, there's divine action in the process is as soon as you have rationality, the ability to choose this versus that, you've got to have morality. I don't know. Think about that. I may be wrong. <laughs> it's almost like it's irreducibly complex. Exactly. That's where I'm going. I like the way we kind of start going back to the beginning. I've always had a rough time trying to figure out why Satan thought he had a, a snowball's chance in a hot place of rebelling against God. 
I mean, how can the how in the world can you do that and think you're going to come out ahead? But I think Satan was the original theistic evolution. I don't think he understood God, and I think he hoped that through all of this uh, evolution and theistic evolution, he's, he thinks he's going to bump in to the thing that would, we would say, ah, oh, God's not who he said he was. We understand the whole mechanism. And so, God, why are you uh, after me? You know, I, I know your mechanism. I can set up mine over here. So I think everything starts back before creation, and you have to go back to creation. And, and I love this thing that in order to... The most outstanding thing in my mind that I'm coming up with recently is love has law. It's there. Love has law. And to try to separate law, I'm talking in the Christian sense, what the world thinks, I mean, it doesn't bother me. What bothers me is what Christians do. So love has law. If we choose to ignore those laws of love, then the whole sexual revolution thing it goes from a binary down to a one thing, and that one thing is your own personal preference. And you can, like Satan, you can call anything you want because you're following your heart. You're following the evolution process. Everything is going from two, and it's going to end up at one. Any rate, I, I, I like this whole whole thing and... Uh, Put in, like you say, I brainstorm. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where it's all headed. But I think I know. <laughs> uh, you, you just said what I wanted to lead to also. Um, in the beginning, Genesis 1 1, it doesn't end until chapter 3 in the story of the fall. And in between the fall and the good creation, you have the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You have a binary system set up, a system of morality. That's part of the beginning. And if you try and explain it through a rationalistic method, or naturalistic especially, uh, you're not going to get anywhere. So I, I really like the direction we can go with this. In the beginning, still is just as true as when it was first written. Comment here. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Wes. I think these are excellent uh, comments, particularly yours, Warren's, and yours. And uh, mine are sort of uh, anticlimactic after this, but it, it appeals to me that um, creation and the presentation of good and evil is indeed a binary system, same for sexuality, but evolution depends on anything but binary, infinitary infinite events and maybe one of them will work for advancing along evolutionary lines the creature so uh, and on the other hand if evolution is, involves infinite number of encounters and possibilities and events and outcomes of which most will not be advantageous but most but uh, maybe one might be every billion years. Uh, the opposite is true in the current social uh, evolution for LGBTQXXX. It's you can be anything you want to be, which would go along with what you're saying, and I think I approve of that. But so much for deep, profound philosophy. We heard about six or seven years ago, we were invited to a special event pushing something at that point in time called the Institute of Altruism. 
at La Sierra. And uh, I kind of wondered about an altruistic institute at an Adventist institution at that point, and I wonder whether whatever happened to it, I presume that it's, it's in line with La Sierra's basic philosophy of putting science first and religion second. And um, I might also comment that um, uh, this idea of having divine encounters at some point after, after evolution got started is interesting and uh, elaborated on in a rather humorous way. I'm personally familiar with a, a friend of mine <clears throat> who is a, really a serious, devout <clears throat> believer in UFOs. And UFOs introduce, of course, aliens coming to this, to this universe. And uh, one of the theories of what a, you know, aliens did besides, besides uh, kidnapping humans is when they kidnap them, they introduce them to morality and then send them back. And um, another variation on that that I've been amused at is the really high academic academicians uh, sometimes engage in witty seminars with the idea that uh, uh, there is indeed intelligence out there in the universe, but uh, it is so far advanced in ours, above ours, that they are amused by us. And uh, that human events have been controlled by alien children who adopt humanity as a science project and influence our reactions just like our teenagers are ex expected to engage in science projects and uh, play with magnetism and so forth. I would sure, uh, be a few comments make, on this, except uh, where did altru the Institute of Altruism at La Sierra go? Does anybody I, know? I don't know where it went. Um, I would make a couple of observations. One of them is that evolutionary theory, with its emphasis on what you might call enlightened selfishness, um, has uh, has a difficult time explaining actual altruism, and therefore you can make two different strategies. One of them is to deny that actual altruism exists, such that you always try to find the selfish motiva motivation for altruism. Interesting paper recently said that, that you get more points in society if you hide your, um, you hide your good works so that they won't be found. Because when they are found, people realize that you did them just because you were a nice guy, and you get nice guy points out of it, which, well, then you'd want to hide them so that they wouldn't be found immediately, but later on they'll be found so that you can get the nice guy points, because otherwise you lose the nice guy points, and then you, uh, and then it's no longer selfish. Um, and those kinds of explanations are just kind of a little on the crazy side. But the interesting thing is that science itself needs morality. And what I mean by that is that if science degenerates to a point where as long as you can publish stuff and get grants, that's all that really counts, that science will lose its authority. Because at that point, the motivation is not to find truth. It is to game the system the best way you can. 
in which case, why well, even listen to people like that? Because you know that they've got an angle. Once you figure out that somebody has an angle, you immediately discount what he says. A used car person comes up to you, and as long as it, they stay on accurate stuff, you're going to kind of buy it. And, well, I can buy this, I can buy that. As soon as you detect that they're not really playing straight with you, whatever else they say, you don't listen to anymore. Um, and science, if it is conducted in an amoral or what I think they would more properly call a post-moral society. When people figure that out, the whole scientific enterprise is doomed to failure. Because why would you want to listen to somebody give you their angle unless it agrees with yours in the first place, in which case you're just, uh, you're just joining your own tribe doing rah-rah stuff. It doesn't really get you where you need to go. And that's important. <coughs> that in a sense, evolutionary theory carries with itself the seeds of its own destruction for moral reasons. I, I think that there are Far too many people that really haven't noticed that and are carrying on their science as if they're going to have the same authority regardless of what happens because after all they are scientists and scientists have authority. They're in way deeper weeds than they realize. Uh, could an evolutionist speculate that uh, that altruism might might uh, be a benefit at the species level, i.e., if, if there's a tendency to to help one's uh, brother or sister in kind, uh, then that would be uh, a benefit to the to the species and, and survival value. Well, they could, um, and some of them might possibly do so. But the interesting thing of it is that, if I can say this experimentally, it doesn't work. That is to say, when you get evolution uh, pushed hard enough, what happens is that speciesism becomes immoral too. And so you have people who are saying a child is a pig, is a, you know, chimp is a... And, and, and making no distinction between species whatsoever. And that's moral, at least in the, the eyes of the people who are doing that. And so it, I don't think you can even sustain it that way eventually. But you're right, that would be the next step. Well, we'd just generalize to the whole species level. Anything that keeps humans alive is good. Uh, it's inadequate, uh, practically speaking. It's it's a nice theoretical posture, but nobody's going to actually uh, give their lives for it and make it stick. That once you do the generalization, then you've taken everything. If you don't have, if you don't have a God who ordained a system which has now become partially broken still with flashes of genius, but not what it was originally. Um, then you don't know where to orient yourself. And if you go to extremes, and it's easy to do that in that atmosphere, the extremes will actually not even be uh, conducive to human survival either. I don't think we can get along without uh, without a God-given morality and make it actually work.
maybe we'll make this the last comment. Go ahead. Well, it it's, uh, refers to some of the earlier comments about, uh, for instance, why would the devil, uh, when he knew he was going to lose, why would he keep on the battle? Uh, it gets into a different area in a ways, but it's something for us to consider. Uh, there is uh, what we call an ego problem, and that it, uh, it can uh, transcend survival. It, uh, dueling, if, if you go into the history of dueling, uh, you find out, hey, uh, uh, several centuries ago, it was very popular in Europe, they didn't know how to stop it. But uh, your, the attitude was, boy, don't you dare challenge me. And if, if your dog uh, threatened to uh, bite you, uh, I mean, bite somebody else, that other person would say, boy, I'm insulted. It sounds a little bit like some of the thinking we hear on, on TV right now. Uh, I'm insulted, and, and uh, I'm going to duel with you. And they didn't know how to stop the thing. It had finally uh, got old. Uh, but the people were carrying swords around in France and so on, and uh, they, they were proud of who they were, and uh, nobody was going to challenge them. And if you dared to challenge them, they had their swords ready. And... Uh, Quite a few people lost their lives uh, in this process. Uh, it tells you that uh, sometimes our ego can get the best of us regard, regardless of consequences. We just as soon die knowing we're right than accommodate to uh, what might be true. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that tells us a little bit about the great controversy and what could be involved here between right and wrong and why uh, the devil, even though he may realize he's lost, he's not going to give in. I will extend that to say I have seen this going on in the battle between creation and evolution where data, strong data, was absolutely rejected. Simply, no, I'm not going to give in. And it's a danger we all face, folks, whether we're creationists or evolutionists. Once you get to a certain point, uh, you're not going to give up what you've defended. Uh, and of course, thousands of examples can be illustrated there in science where conclusions that were wrong. The person will not give up in spite of that he's going to die still defending that. And of course a new generation comes up that doesn't support it and, and we've got another case. And, and when we say, oh, isn't the science great? It, it revises it itself. Instead of realizing hey, uh, there's a personal problem here. Uh, that we don't recognize. Uh, that is our, our ego. You want to make one comment? No, no. You oh, okay. Well, I'll tell you what then. I want to make yes, okay. Well, we'll give you a shot at it. Here's a, you're going to get two mics here. There you go. Two you mics. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> this is very interesting, and uh, Ken Hart is not there. So. Some of us go to his class after this, but he's not there today. So if you have some time, a um, couple of things. Number one, I've seen the little video clips of a lion protecting uh -huh. a little little baby baboon. Uh -huh. It might have eaten the mother of the baboon. I don't know. But where does it get that from? I I think I might have even watched a lion with the lamb also protecting. Uh -huh. Where did it come from? Did, did it come from uh, evolution? Or I mean, 
how does one explain this? And then I'm going to go to another one quickly. But if you want me to, I'll, what is we human beings, Eli Lilly, will come up with a drug, and will come up with a study, and it will choose the population that it wants to prove that their drug is better than someone else's. So, and then of course you find that out. I think it was red wine. Red wine. Yeah. Has, okay. I think it came from Cornell University and these scientists. And how many millions of young people were hurt by his claims? Um, and it was, he was proven wrong. Whereas the animal kingdom, perhaps their morality was given by their creator. Yeah, well, they were not, uh, well, we, we all know that every, uh, all the animals were eating grass uh, or vegetation uh, at creation. Uh, and that is going to happen in a uh, world made new. Uh, but now they're eating, of course, fine. One animal will eat, eat the other animal. But where did this compassion come not to tear up that little baby? Well, the, the answer that it would traditionally be given for that is that the lion somehow got a maternal instinct aroused by something the baboon did or, or the situation of some kind. And therefore, the, the lion, instead of de identifying the baboon as food, identified it as baby. But it's not the lioness, it's the lion. It does not have the mother instinct. Well, <laughs> Yeah, and that's uh, that's a problem then. Well, I mean, I'm, a, I'm giving you this, this would, what would be the standard answer. I'm not sure that it's entirely adequate, and I think that's important, is that I think there are traces of altruism that still exist in our society and in, our, in the natural world that are actually God-given. Um... And they don't have a good evolutionary explanation. And that the people who are trying to do the theistic evolution thing and try to explain it with standard morality really can't do a good job. And I think it's a good argument. And I think it's an argument that's good enough to have convinced C.S. Lewis, which we'll study next week, by the way, and... Um, and also Francis Collins. And I think that when we approach theistic evolutionists rather than say, well, you're just all wrong and you need to straighten up, I think we need to encourage the parts they do understand, hopefully bring them to flower, and then point out the contradictions between that and some of the other uh, beliefs they do have that are not as well founded. Um, there, there are two models as to what to do if you're trying to change somebody's outlook. One of them is tear the whole thing down. And the other one is take the parts that are good, try to build them up further and, and undercut the other parts. And you can see this with different approaches to Islam. You can see this with different approaches to, you know, what do you do with Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, yeah, they have a belief in the Bible. Of course, their translation is better than everybody else's. But, but I would rather not completely tear down all of their belief systems. I want that belief in the Bible. I just want it to be redirected. And when it gets redirected, I think that uh, it will become more evident to them that, in fact, what they're finding is the fulfillment of truth. Uh, Jesus <laughs> doesn't seem to have torn down everything that anybody had. He seems to have built it up in some ways. You know, people who were living by the law, rather than saying, you've got it all wrong, 
he said, you know what? The law is permanent. In fact, it's even stronger than you think. And he gave a whole sermon on that. You've heard it said of old, thou shalt not kill. But I say to you, don't even get mad. You've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, don't even look. And so you have an entire... Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's more of an unfolding of what's already there than it is a wholesale destruction of everything they believed in. And I think that the same thing can be done. I laud Francis Collins for coming out of an atheist home and becoming convinced of Christianity and becoming convinced on the basis of this very question, the moral law. And that's why he, do, he can't be put into the same category as many of his supposed colleagues. Because in a way, he's not really a colleague. I would rather be building on the parts that he does recognize <laughs> and point out that you don't believe the scientific establishment, or at least what used to be the scientific establishment, about the universe you don't believe them about morality, why are you so sure that they've got it right about the origin of life? And once the origin of life is cracked, why are you so sure that, that evolutionary theory can explain everything? And then once that's cracked, then go and say, and why are you so sure that it took as long as they say? So I think there needs to be a natural progression rather than trying to just wholesale destroy everything. He got part of it right, and we should say so. Interestingly, some of his supposed colleagues have got part of it wrong. Evolutionary theory can't explain it, and they're living in fear that but someday it will because science progresses always, and we need to be saying no. That's it. As a matter of fact, science doesn't always progress. Right now, science is degenerating. It depends on what you call science. But the current science cons scientific consensus is degenerating. Yes? I just might add to that, uh, in this whole discussion we've had today, uh, Basically, there's little altruism, I should say none, in the principle of survival of the fittest, which is the basic mechanism of evolution. And I find all these alternatives that they've proposed today are rather weak in the contrast of that basic That's an principle of survival of the fittest. <laughs> Anyway, come back next week and we will see whether theistic evolutionists have a right to claim C.S. Lewis as their hero.